Welcome to YAA's Impact, Advancing Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Through Social Change. My name is Greg Sterling. I have the honor of serving as Dean of Yale Divinity School and the pleasure of introducing the featured speaker for this session. The descendant of Africans who survived the Middle Passage and endured slavery on these shores, Bishop Michael Curry was born in Chicago in 1953 to devout Episcopalian parents. When his mother died at a premature age, his grandmother stepped in to assist his father in raising Bishop Curry and his sister, a relationship that he has cherished throughout his life and commemorated by giving the title of his autobiography Songs My Grandma Sang. Bishop Curry distinguished himself academically at an early age, the product of Buffalo, New York public schools. He attended Hobart College from which he graduated with high honors and then came here to Yale to the Divinity School to earn his Master of Divinity degree before seeking ordination. Since leaving YDS, he has received at least three honorary doctorates. Bishop Curry's decision to become an Episcopal priest was undoubtedly heavily influenced by the example of his father, who was himself an Episcopal priest and an exemplar of a priest who worked for social change. Following his graduation, he was ordained the same year, 1978, and then began serving parishes, distinguishing himself in long tenures at three different parishes, one in North Carolina, one in Ohio, and one in Maryland. In all of these locales, Bishop Curry served the underprivileged and marginal. He did so by establishing ecumenical summer day camps for children, creating networks of daycare providers, building new educational centers, and brokering the investments of millions, millions of dollars in the inner cities where he resided. It's hardly a surprise that he was elected the 11th Bishop of North Carolina in 2000, where he continued to champion social justice, immigration policy reform, and to advocate for marriage equality. It seems entirely fitting and a natural step that in 2015, the Episcopal Church elected him on the very first ballot to a nine-year term as the 27th presiding bishop and primate of the Episcopal Church in America. A noteworthy author of five books, including the 2020 book, Love is the Way, which will be the basis for his lecture this evening or today, which whatever time it is when you're watching. Bishop Curry is a celebrated speaker traveling the United States and the world. He has been a significant figure at major events, presiding at the funeral service for President George H.W. Bush. But perhaps more than any other single event in popular imaginations or the popular culture, we remember him for the sermon that he delivered on love at the marriage of Harry and Meghan in 2018. His sermon transfixed the audience that was there and the broader international audience watching on television. As one commentator said, speaking from an American perspective, we got up early for a wedding, and now I quote, we did not expect to be taken to church, end of quote. Do not be surprised if during this lecture you feel like you have been taken to church. 
you will have been taken by one of the most important voices in American Christianity and an extremely important voice in America for social change and justice today, Bishop Michael Curry. It is a privilege to share some thoughts with you for Impact 2, Advancing Diversity and Inclusion. I want to thank the Yale Alumni Association for this invitation, and I thank you for this consideration. It is important. In fact, it is ultimately important for the survival of the entire human family and frankly, all of God's creation itself. Let me show you what I mean. In a little known quote, Dr. King said, we must discover the power of love, the redemptive power of love. And when we discover it, we will be able to make of this old world a new world for love is the only way. Love is the way. Ultimately, it is the only way because love can help and heal when nothing else can. Love can lift up and liberate when nothing else will. Love can lead and guide us along the way beyond our unenlightened self-interest beyond all of our factions and divisions, the way of unselfish, sacrificial love can show us the way to be human and humane society, civilization, world, indeed a human family. But, but let me offer two caveats at the very beginning. First, the love that I speak of is not the province of any particular religious tradition. I come at it from one who is a Christian, but many of the great religious teachings of the world in a variety of ways speak of this truth. Love is not the province of any particular religion. <clears throat> and the reason for that is the source of love is not humanly generated. The source of love is divinely decreed. The source of love is God. First John chapter four in the New Testament says, beloved, let us love one another because love is of God and those who love are born of God. And then it says, those who do not love do not know God because God is love. Love is an equal opportunity employer. Love is truly pluralistically accessible. Love is profoundly ecumenical and interfaith. Love is bipartisan, multipartisan. Love is not the province of anybody. It is the gift of God. Secondly, I want to say that as a caveat, that when I use the word love, I do so in a very specific sense. I'm not speaking of love in a sentimental, sweet, or soft sense. I'm speaking of love in the sense that is most frequently used in the New Testament in the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. Love characterized by the Greek word used to translate it very often in the New Testament, agape. This kind of love is unselfish love. It is sacrificial love. It is a way of love that seeks the good and the welfare and the well-being of others as well as the self. And this way of love, spoken of by Dr. King in that quote, is the way to human civilization and life where, as the old slaves of America's antebellum South used to say, there will be plenty good room, plenty good room, plenty good room for all God's children. This way of love it's the way. A few years ago, I was asked to uh, be a guest on TMZ, a, a station that I had I, I knew of, um, but 
had never expected to be asked to be a guest. And so I said, yes. And in the course of the conversation, which went on for quite a while, the interviewer asked me something that I had not been asked that directly up until that point in time, but I have been asked subsequently over and over and over again. The interviewer said, you know, most of our viewers are young adults. Most of them have not lived as long as you have. They haven't seen what you've seen. And to be sure, some of what you say when you speak of love is based on your experience, your experience of your own life and experience of the world. They haven't seen that. And they want to believe that love really is the way. But their question is, will it work? Will it work not simply in the precincts of religious tradition or philosophical reflection, but will it work in the corporate boardroom? Will it work in the councils of politics? Will it work in the factories and on the assembly lines? Will it work in the world, in the hard, tough, rough world? They want to believe it but will it work? And I have to tell you that that question, I hadn't anticipated it. The first time it was posed, it threw me back. And I had to stop and think, will it work? And I realized almost in a split second, oh, it's not easy. Don't misunderstand what I say. It is not easy. But it is, this way of love is the only thing that has ever worked for human progress and human civilization and for the good and the welfare and the well-being of the entire human family and all of God's creation. Consider the alternative. Consider the rule and the reign of selfishness. You know, I've, I've often said that while hate is in opposition to love, the actual opposite of love is not hate. Specifically, the actual opposite of love is selfishness. It is self-centeredness. Love is contrary to that. Love is the cure for that. But the opposite of true love is self-centeredness. And the truth of the matter is the way of self-centered living does not work. And ran notwithstanding, it doesn't work. It has never worked and it never will. The way of self-centeredness, um, unenlightened self-interest, as John Mill um, uh, sort of said it, um, inordinate self-love, as, as Reinhold Niebuhr taught us, or hubris, that prideful self-will that makes me the center of everything. Dr. King called that the, Coper the reverse Copernican revolution, where I am the center of the world, and everything else, and everybody else, including God, is on the periphery. And it is my will my way or the highway, that way of self-centeredness, it has not, it does not, it will not, it cannot work. And if you don't believe me, just, just look at our immediate history. We saw it on display in Charlottesville a few years ago. As people walked through the streets, young people walked through the streets, at night with tiki torches in their hands, shouting, Jews will not replace us. The way of selfishness is the way of bigotry and the way of hatred and the way of indifference, and it does not work. We saw it when an officer of the law, public safety, snuffed out the life of George Floyd like he was a thing not a child of God, his brother. The way of self-centeredness, it doesn't work. And, and, and we saw it on January 6th. We saw it as the citadel of democracy was breached by selfishness, born probably of fear, fear of the other. We saw raging anti-Semitism there. We saw fascism there. 
We saw Christian nationalism there. We saw the elements of self-centeredness there. Black police officers on the Capitol Hill said they were called the N-word more times in that one day in that seat. That is the reign of selfishness and self-centeredness. It does not, it cannot, it will not work. No, no, no. Unselfish, sacrificial love. It's the only thing that can work. It is the only way that has ever worked. Selfishness doesn't. If you don't believe me, consider, uh, some of you may remember a book or have heard of a book by Robert Fulgram. It was a book entitled, All I Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And it's a wonderful little, little book. Um, and, and he identified things that he learned, basic principles and values he learned in kindergarten. One, for example, share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush. And when you go out into the world, Watch out for traffic, hold hands, and stick together. That is not the way of selfishness. That is the way of selflessness that discovers the true self for us all. Imagine a world where the opposite of these values is the case. Don't share everything. Get what you can get and don't worry about anybody else. Play fair? No, you don't have to play fair. The rules don't apply to you or anybody else. Don't hit people? No, the opposite, hit them. Clean up your own mess? No, leave your mess and let somebody else clean it up. Don't take things that aren't yours? No, steal, take it, go ahead. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. No, don't say you're sorry. Just hurt them. Wash your hands before you eat. Well, in these days of a global pandemic, Dr. Fauci and others have taught us you need to wash your hands all day long, but imagine a world where none of us do. Flush, need I say more? And when you go out into the world, watch out for traffic and hold hands and stick together. No, when you go out into the world, it's every man, every woman, every person every child for themselves. That is not a world, a society, a community that is sustainable for human life. No, I realized in that moment on TMZ that when they asked me, will this love work? The answer is, it is the only thing that can work or that has ever will work unenlightened self-love that seeks the good, enlightened self-love, enlightened love, that, that unselfish love that seeks the good and the welfare and the well-being of others. It's the only thing that has ever worked. Think about people in your own life who have made a difference in your life for the good. They did so because not because they got paid for it necessarily, not primarily because they got something out of it, though surely they did. They did it because they cared about you and because they really cared about you, they made a difference in your life. That's love. It may be some teacher, a parent, a friend. Think about it. Those folk made a difference in your life. Because even if they didn't use the word, they, they loved you and it made a difference. It, it's true in our social life. The people who have made a difference in our lives and in the life of the world, they are people who have sometimes sacrificed and given up for the good and well-being of others. If you don't believe me, ask Susan B. Anthony. If you don't believe me, ask Harriet Tubman. If you don't believe me, ask Mahatma Gandhi. If you don't believe me, ask A. Philip Randolph. If you don't believe me, ask Johanna Saul. If you don't believe me, ask Stephen Biko. If you don't believe me, ask the Dalai Lama. If you don't believe me, ask Fannie Lou Hamer. You don't believe me. Ask Malala of Pakistan. Ask Greta Thornburg. The very life of the planet 
will only be saved itself when we move beyond our own unenlightened self-interest to the good and the welfare of all. Inclusion, diversity, true love is the only way. Democracy, love is the only way. This is not a sentiment of which we speak. It is a spiritual value of ultimate import. Let me bring this to a conclusion. In 1963, I was in the fifth grade, in Miss Lenny's fifth grade, and I remember it because that was the year that there was some desegregation movement in uh, the Buffalo public school system. And so I went from fourth grade in one school that was predominantly black, not exclusively, but predominantly so, uh, to another school that, that was actually in an Italian neighborhood it was part of some desegregation effort by the city. And so I remember that year, but I also remember it because Miss Lenny was a wonderful teacher. And I remember, among other things, this was 1963. This was the year that President Kennedy was assassinated. We were actually sitting in class, listening to public radio. This was a long time ago, listening to public something on public radio when they interrupted the program. This was also the year when we learned fractions in the fifth grade. And in social studies in that, that year, we learned about something called the Great Seal of the United States. And I remember it like I'm sitting at Miss, in the desk in the classroom. As Lenny taught us about the Great Seal and the Founding Fathers and, and probably some of the mythology surrounding that, but the, but the basic truths of it. And you'll remember on the Great Seal, it's the, you sometimes see it with President Biden and you'll see the flag behind it with the great seal on it. It's the one with the, the eagle and the eagle has in Italians has um, arrows in one and um, um, olive branches in the other. And, and above the eagle, there's sort of a scroll, if you will, banner and written in the banner of the Latin words, e pluribus unum, which roughly translated mean from many, one. From many diverse peoples, one nation, one people. E pluribus unum. Last September, I got curious about the origin of the phrase um, or the saying, and um, and Ms. Lenny probably taught us that. I just didn't remember it from um, from the fifth grade. I'm 67 years old now, so that was a long time ago. But I just started doing some digging around, and I checked this with with a friend who is a historian to verify it, to make sure I wasn't just reading something into it. And he said, no, no, you're on target. The founders were very much enamored of the ancient Greek and Rome, Romans, especially. And um, the, the, the phrase probably has origins in the writings of Cicero, of ancient Rome, of the Roman Republic. And Cicero <clears throat> said this, and I quote, and this may well be the origin of e pluribus unum, which is the motto if you will, of the United States of America, a way of claiming how democracy is possible. Cicero said, and I quote, when each person loves the other as much as he loves himself, it makes e pluribus unum, one out of many, possible. This is not a sentiment of which we speak. This is a hard headed reality that can show us the way, the way to a world where there is, as the slaves used to say, plenty good room, plenty good room, plenty good room in my father's kingdom. A world where do, we do not allow any child to go to bed hungry at night, a world where there is truly equal justice under the law for all. A world where there is liberty and justice, not just here in the United States, but in all the states of the world. A world where we learn 
as the old slaves used to sing, how to lay down our swords and shield down by the riverside to study war no more. Of such a world, of such a world as Langston Hughes once wrote, I dream. We must remember the power of love, the redemptive power of love. And when we discover that, we will be able to make of this old world a new world. For love is the way. God bless you and thank you.